Welcome to FACT's webinar called Managing Internal Parasites for Sheep and Goats, Know the Enemy. This is part one of a three-part series. Our presenter is Linda Coffey. This webinar is hosted by Food Animal Concerns Trust. I am Larissa McKenna, FACT's Humane Farming Program Director, and I will be moderating this webinar. Thank you for joining us. At this time, I'm delighted to introduce our presenter, Linda Coffey, Program Specialist with NCAT and ATRA. Linda comes from a family farm in central Missouri where they raise cattle, hogs, sheep, and horses. She holds a master's degree in animal science and works primarily on sheep, goat, and multi-species grazing issues. We are incredibly lucky to have her with us today and for some extra webinars coming up later to share her experience and expertise. So with that, I'm now going to turn the floor over to Linda so that she may begin her presentation. Linda, please take it away. Well, thank you, Larissa, and thank you all of you who have joined us today. I really am excited to have this opportunity. Um, I work for the nonprofit, the National Center for Appropriate Technology, and I need to share a little bit about that first. Um, it's a national nonprofit. It, we advocate for small-scale, local, and sustainable solutions to reduce poverty, promote healthy communities, and protect natural resources. And one of the ways that we fill our mission is by managing the ATRA Information Service for farmers. And I don't know if you all have, have met us before, but I encourage you to check us out. We offer free technical advice on this 800 number, 800-346-9140. We answer that Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. And when you call, a specialist in some part of the country will answer. And nearly all of us are farmers, which I think gives us a very practical um, approach to your questions. We also have an excellent website with lots of publications, some of which we are going to be emailing to you tomorrow with Larissa's follow-up email. And we're putting a new focus on multimedia um, things. People learn that way. A lot of you learn that way better than through written materials. So we have developed tutorials and videos and webinars. We have a podcast, which you can subscribe to or get off our website, and we have some wonderful online courses. So this is what the website looks like, and you can get a sense of just how much we cover. It's, it's huge. Um, I'll call your attention to a couple of things on this page. One is the search bar. Because we have so many materials, it can be difficult sometimes to find what you're looking for. Use the search bar and also call us. Uh, that 800 number is, is up there on the website. We encourage you to call us and say, what have you got on this subject? Or just ask a question. We welcome that. You can see in the blue bar across where you can get to the tutorials, the webinars, the videos, and, and publications, and many of our other fine features. And I want to just mention, if you like what we do, we would appreciate you becoming a supporter. So the subscribe to ATRA and that gold button, um, that would be awesome. So my name is Linda Coffey, and I work for NCAT on the ATRA project, and I also work on Maple Gorge Farm, which my husband and I own near Prairie Grove, Arkansas, which is near Fayetteville in the northwest corner of Arkansas. It's a small farm. It's about 50 acres, and about half of that is really grazable, and we raise Gulf Coast sheep, and some alpine dairy goats. And as Larissa said at the beginning, I grew up on a farm. I've been raising sheep since I was maybe 10 or 12. I've been raising sheep that whole time. And that's the perspective that I'm bringing to you today, is that of a fellow farmer. Before I get started in this, I've got to give a shout out to the American Consortium for Small Ruminant Parasite Control. This is a consortium of researchers and extension educators, and they do fabulous work, and we all owe them a great debt. They do the hard work of the research to give us the answers that we need. So I especially want to thank Dr. Joan Burke, who has funded quite a lot of the work that I've done through ATRA in writing about internal parasites, and in fact is um, helping provide some funding for this three-part webinar series. So thank you to Dr. Burke. And all the other members of the consortium have been so generous in sharing their knowledge, in, a in answering questions, 
and you've got to check out their website, wormx.info. It's absolutely a gold mine for farmers like us raising sheep and goats and camelids. This is what their webpage looks like, and it's just full of state-of-the-art information, including video library, including uh, written materials. So that's illustrating the FAMACHA technique, which I wondered if you had known about. Um, FAMACHA, I'll just, while we're here, see what they're doing is looking at that inner eyelid. It's a test to assess anemia, and you match it up with the card. So um, we'll talk more about that in part two, actually. So today we're talking about know thy enemy, because we need to know what we are up against. Next week in part two, we're going to talk about preventive strategies. And in part three, we're going to talk about treatment options for what to do when, when the preventive strategies are not quite enough. I hope you can join us for all three of these to get the full picture, because that will really help us in managing our farms. Why should we go through three weeks of talking about internal parasites? Well, as you probably know, internal parasites are the worst health problem that we face with our small ruminants. Parasites have developed adaptations. They have developed resistance to our deworming medications. So they don't work as well as they used to. But even when they did work well, deworming medications were always a short-term fix. If you only deworm and then put them right back in the same management you had, you're going to be right back in trouble. And so knowledge is power. Let's figure out how to manage better. Today, what we're going to cover, it's not a very long presentation today, the basic life cycle of internal parasites, what the parasites do inside our animals, and then what we see when they are infected with internal parasites. We're going to talk about some of the amazing survival mechanisms the parasites have that make them such a worthy foe. So this is the framework for our discussion, the parasite life cycle. This is a really simple life cycle. We're going to start at the top, the 12 o'clock position. The animal ingests the parasite larva. And then the larva changes inside the animal, takes up residence in the digestive tract, and then when they mature, the adults lay eggs, which are passed in the feces. When the conditions are right, those eggs hatch, and the larvae move in moisture up blades of grass, and the animals ingest the larva and repeat the cycle. So let's break that down. First of all, the parasite larvae are ingested usually while the animal is grazing. And most of the parasite larvae are in the lower couple inches of the grass. So while they're grazing, they take in the larvae, usually very near manure. And so uh, an animal tra tra tramping through manure like they do on my farm and then putting their feet in a feed trough is causing a problem, too, because they're moving larvae around. So while they're grazing, and, and let's remember, these larvae are specific to a host, mostly. Sheep, goats, and camelids share internal parasites. So those of us who are raising both sheep and goats, that's increasing the number of parasites that our animals are exposed to. Cattle and horses do not share, and that's part of the rationale for multi-species grazing. So sheep, goats, and camelids share parasites. Cattle and horses do not, except sometimes baby calves can get barber pole, but on the whole, they don't share. So our animal has ingested the parasite larva. The next thing that happens is the adults are taking up residence in the body, the larva and the adults. And what they do next depends on what species they are. So our big player, where I live and probably where you live too, is the barber pole worm, which you see in this photo up here. Homonchus contortus. Okay, so the red stripe is blood, which they've ingested from, I call them the victim, but, you know, the host. The white stripe is ovaries packed full of eggs. This is a very prolific egg layer. I've seen some numbers that are astounding, um, but definitely in the thousands of eggs per day, thousands, each one. 
These animals, when they're as big as they get, they're about an inch long, and they're living in the abomasum, and they really like summertime. So what they're doing, they, they have a, like a lancet on the end that scratches the abomasum, and then the, it starts to bleed, and they ingest the blood. So barber pole worm will cause anemia. Now, brown stomach worm and bankrupt worm are related. They're also roundworms, and they live in the digestive tract, but they don't suck blood. They're making their living off the, off the groceries of the animals and off the um, mucosa lining, and they cause lesions. They kind of gum up the works. They don't, digestion doesn't happen like, like it should. They're causing inflammation in the digestive tract. So they are going to cause diarrhea, but not anemia. Coccidia are not a roundworm. They're a protozoan parasite with a more complicated life cycle. That's the one that's shown here in this graphic. And I want you to talk, I want to talk about coccidia because uh, they do cause a lot of damage, particularly in young animals, and they do not respond to the same dewormers as the roundworms do. So it's important to get a differential diagnosis for those. As I said, they don't respond to the same drugs, and it's important to know that they can cause permanent damage in the intestines. So if, if you don't treat them, uh, that animal might always be stunted, just a poor doer, looks scruffy. Adult animals usually have immunity, but the young animals under stress. And what can cause stress? Cold rain, lots of mud. I've got those at my house. Um, weaning time. Anytime when the animals are being transported, those are all stressful conditions. And scours is the first symptom of the coccidiosis. So uh, I show you this photo because this is the view we want to be checking. As we have our animals eating at a feed trough, let's check the back ends. This is a perfectly healthy kid. There is no evidence of scouring legs and under the tail very clean. I also wanted to talk about the chicken here because... Coxie, like the other worms, is species-specific. So your chicken can get coccidiosis, and you should treat it, but that is not the same organism that would infect sheep or goats. So don't worry about that cross-transmission. The other thing I wanted to mention is my feed troughs here, this PVC pipe. I really like having feed troughs that are easy to clean because coccidia is a sanitation kind of problem, Okay. So remember I said about the dirty hooves in the feed trough? I can sweep these. I can hose them out. It's really nice to have a um, feeding system that you can keep clean. I want to refer you also to our ATRA website. Look for this publication. Actually, maybe we'll email this link to you um, about coccidiosis because it really is an important one to know about. And when we see our young animals break with scours, I think we need to be taking some action to prevent that permanent damage. Under a microscope, you can't tell the difference between the roundworms, the brown stomach worm, the barber pole worm, the bankrupt worm. And all the internal parasites are going to cause similar symptoms. I'm I'm thinking all of them will show, uh, the animals will show low energy. They'll be lagging behind or maybe laying off by themselves. They will not want to eat. So when you are feeding your other animals, one that isn't anxious to come up to the trough, that's one to really hone in on, focus your attention on. And even if they do eat, remember about the parasites being inside causing lesions and causing damage inside the um, digestive tract, so that decreases digestion. So whatever they do eat, they're not getting good use of. And those worms are in there uh, eating into your pocketbook, the old phrase said. So they are taking some of the groceries that the animal gets. All of these things are causing slow growth or weight loss. And it's particularly apparent if you've got a dairy animal the lower production of milk is pretty dramatic, but it's also happening with wool or meat. And they just don't feel good. You can see by this animal here, 
just look first at the posture and how those those rear legs are tucked in under the body. The head is kind of droopy. The eyes look dull. The tail is hanging down, which is not normal in a goat. And then we look at the thinness. You see the backbone is very clear and apparent. The hips, the femur. This is a very, very thin animal. If you can see on your slide, at the end of the tail, there's some fecal soiling. This animal has had scours at some point in the past. The ear is hiding under the jaw, so we can't tell whether it has bottle jaw or anemia. But just at a glance, this animal is very, very sick. And an animal that's heavily infected like this will be also shedding a lot of eggs onto the pasture. So in addition to the symptoms that we just talked about, if they're infected with barber pole worm, they will also be anemic, which causes some of the lagging behind and the low energy. And they may have bottle jaw. And so this photo in the upper right is showing what bottle jaw looks like. You see that little fluid underneath the jaw. That's called bottle jaw. In the lower left, I'm checking a goat for anemia, and I'm using the FOMACHA system looking at that mucosa membrane, seeing whether she's anemic or not. But a worm that is not a barber pole worm may not cause any anemia, but they may have diarrhea, so scours. So again, just like with coccidia, let's look at the back of our animals and be looking for signs of trouble. I want to show you this animal because, first of all, she's not sick, but it fooled me the first time I saw this. It's like, what is this under the neck? Do you see that little swelling? It's, she's colored white there, so that makes it a little harder to see. But I was very puzzled because she's a perfectly healthy kid. What is that swelling? It's not in the right place for bottle jaw, but I didn't know what it was. So I'm putting this slide in here to make a couple of points. You might not know what it is either. I had a mentor who, after I described the animal and where the swelling was, she said, oh, that's milk goiter, nothing to be afraid of, nothing to be worried about. If you don't have a mentor, I highly recommend it. I also wanted to bring up the point that I knew that my animal was healthy, and you can know, too, by using the five-point check. This is a technique where you assess your animals using your eyes and your hands, and we start with the eyes of the animal, using the FOMACHA technique and the card to assess anemia. And then we feel for the body condition score over the backbone and the ribs, looking for weight loss, looking for whether they're getting enough nutrition. And we look under the tail for evidence of scouring, or, or is it clean? And we look at the coat or the wool. Is it shiny and smooth, like a healthy animal has, or rough and dull? In the official five-point check, they look at the nose for nose bots, but that's not an issue for us, so I skip that. And I look instead at energy, vitality, posture. And let me just point out that you can do a lot of the five-point check from a distance. When we go out among our animals, we can be looking for evidence of scouring. We can check out the coats. Are they looking good? Are they looking healthy? We can definitely look for the energy and vitality, and we should. Two of these, you kind of have to get in close, and that is the FOMACHA technique. But again, the eyes are not going to be the only symptom the animal is showing. So if an animal is not laying around or depressed or off feed, I've never seen one that had pale eyes that didn't also have those other symptoms. The back, though, I think it's really important because nutrition is so important for health that we get in the habit of, whenever we can, feel our animal's condition feel for um, how much fat cover they have, and just get a sense of whether they are well-nourished or not. So again, if we looked at this animal, when I checked her eyes, she was a perfect one on the FOMACHA score, bright pink, no sign of anemia at all. You can see probably even in this picture, for a dairy goat, she's really fleshy. Her coat is very smooth, very shiny, her tail was perfectly clean, and her energy, her posture, everything was perfectly normal for her, which is why I was sure that wasn't bottle jaw. Anyway, the point is, let's be looking at our animals. Let's be walking around. Let's look at, figure out what's normal for them, 
and pay attention to subtle signs. Moving back to the parasite life cycle. We've just discussed what damage they can do inside the animal, damaging the guts. Um, but while they're in there too, they are beginning to mate and lay eggs, which are passed in the feces. And when conditions are right, those eggs will hatch and the larva will move. How the larva move is in water, like this dew drop. Can you see all those little white squiggly like lines? Imagine those are larvae and your animal taking one bite of grass can take in that many infective larvae to start causing trouble inside their system. And this is a numbers game. They can tolerate a few. It's when they get too many that they'll start to show signs of sickness. So anytime we have more animals in one place for a length of time, we're having more manure and more eggs. And those eggs are protected in the manure pellet. They can hang out on your pasture for a really long time. When moisture is present and there's enough warmth, they can hatch. And it doesn't take a whole lot of warmth. 50 degrees is enough for some of the roundworms. And even homonchus, which really loves summer, hot, moist conditions, will start to hatch at 60 degrees. I don't know about where you live, but I can have 60 degrees days just about every month of the year in Arkansas. And they live a long time. In cool climates, they can live for 6 to 18 months out on your pasture. In hot climates, their, metal their metabolism is revved up, they develop faster, and thankfully they die faster. But it still takes 4 to 6 weeks for you to get any kind of dieback that's significant. So Dr. Burke did a study in Arkansas looking at what happens if you get off a pasture after three and a half days and you don't go back for 35 days, the point being to let some of the larvae die. And she found that 35 days did help. You didn't have to deworm the lambs as often if you gave it that much rest. But longer is better. Um, my friend Dr. Steve Hart at Langston University recommends 60 days of rest. And again, longer is better. Dry weather does help to kill the eggs and the larva. They desiccate, they dry out. But cold weather, let me go back. Cold weather doesn't do as much good as you might hope. Larissa, up there with your snow, the eggs are safe under that snow cover, and they're not dying. Um, they found homonchus as far north as Norway. So even though it's a tropical worm, it can really have a wide range where it can be adapted. Uh, I have a very healthy respect for their survival, <laughs> their survival mechanisms. Once they hatch, again, when it's warm enough, when there's moisture, they can move up the grass blades, mostly, again, within the lower two inches, but there will be some higher than that, three inches, four inches. As you move higher up the grass blade, though, the numbers will definitely be decreasing. So the majority are down near the manure. They'll also move, uh, the larvae also move down into the soil to shelter from bad conditions. And they can move sideways. They can be splashed with rain. So you might find a larva out 12 inches or even further from the manure pad. Still, sink manure. Mostly where the manure is is where the larvae are going to be. And again, with the picture of the barn lot here, if you've got a lot of animals coming back to a central point, like to get a drink or to come in for feeding, you've got a contamination zone. How long does it take for the life cycle? Well, that depends on the moisture, as I've said, and the temperature, and also on the animal status. But in the summer, eggs if they have moisture, can, cha can transfer to larva as fast as four days. And then when they are infective larva up on the grass blade and they're ingested, they can turn into an egg-laying adult inside your animal in two to three weeks in the summertime. So the total cycle can be, like from egg to egg, it can be as little as 21 days or even less. And so you can see how if the animals are, are kept in one area, the problem just multiplies 
over the course of time. I said animal status makes a difference, and here's a couple of terms that are important to know. First of all, hypobiosis. I think of it as hibernation. So in hypobiosis, the parasites are hanging out inside the animal waiting for spring. It is not a good time for them out on the pasture. Maybe it's too cold for them to do well, so they just have a safe harbor inside our animals. And what they're waiting for is in the spring when the hormones change and the animal is about to give birth, those parasites ramp it up. They wake up. They begin shedding eggs. This is called the periparturian rise. Peri meaning around parturian birth. Periparturian rise. This is a really important concept to have. Um, as I said, the larvae have this amazing ability to survive bad conditions. So they're waiting inside the animal, and then they're waiting their opportunity, and it's a perfect storm for our animals. They're under stress. Delivery is stressful. Lactating is stressful. Their nutritional demands are greatly increased quickly, and so their immune system is temporarily suppressed. They don't have enough nutrition to, to handle all the demands that they have, and the immune system um, gets lowered. These parasites are so opportunistic. They can shelter in the soil, they can shelter in the manure, or in the animal. They slow down their metabolisms when it's cold, and they're waiting for spring and the periparturian time. And then they hit those young animals that have no immunity yet, and stressed animals, those that are not well fed, um, animals at weaning time, or in bad climatic conditions, animals that have been sick, if they've had pneumonia, say, they're very vulnerable to parasites. Anything that has had to get on a truck and move, old animals like the ewe in this picture are all very vulnerable. And let's remember that being infected with internal parasites is a stress in itself. So that can set them up to get pneumonia or other illnesses. And also, um, it's not only just one parasite that is infecting them at a time, because when the immune system is challenged with one parasite, then others also can, can take that opportunity. And again, when conditions are favorable, when it's warm, when it's wet, when there are a lot of host animals present and concentrated, they can mature quickly and multiply at a scary rate, particularly Homonchus contortus, the barber pole worm. That is such a prolific egg layer. So could our animals, my animals, be in trouble now? Well, as you can see, I don't have enough grass for grazing. I know that, but they don't seem to. They keep trying to get every blade of green that they can. The pastures are turning green, and the sheep are hungry for that. They're, they have hay, and they eat some hay, but they also are trying to pick up uh, blades of grass. They have just been lambing. They're under stress because of the periparturiant rise, and we've had weather that gets really warm and then really cold and then really warm and then really cold, which is, I'm hoping, stressful for the parasites. I'm hoping the cold spells have been cold enough to kill off some larvae. But I also know that over in the hay feeding area, there is some shelter for the larvae. So even if my animals aren't showing any signs right now, I need to be watchful. I'm looking for signs of scours or any animal that doesn't act quite right. And I'm going to have to be careful when it's time, when the pastures are really ready to graze. Later on in the spring, the area where we've been lambing has probably had a lot of eggs dropped on it. So it being a highly contaminated area, I need to be taking that into consideration as I get into the grazing season. It's been a kind of a frustrating talk, hasn't it? All this bad news, all this talk about the problems and not the solutions. But let's remember sheep and goats and parasites have coexisted for thousands of years. And they can do it on our farms, too. We're just going to have to be smart, use as many preventive strategies as we can to fight this enemy. 
And we need to know our animals and keep observing them so we see those subtle signs of trouble and maybe change our management quicker instead of waiting till it's a train wreck. So what we're going to try to do is support animal health by keeping stress low, by giving them plenty of good nutrition, by paying attention to sanitation. Remember the clean feed troughs? And when we graze, we're going to try as much as we can to avoid the parasites as much as we can. This just requires thinking about how they get infected and how we can prevent them from being infected. We're going to select animals that are tougher. And then when we have animals that are sick, we will treat them, but only them, not the whole flock, not the whole herd. And we're going to use what we know about these parasites to plan our strategies. So I hope you can come back for part two. Before then, let me tell you, um, this is my short list of resources. I really encourage you to check into these. First of all, the ATRA website and how you can find, how you can find our stuff there about internal parasites is go to the bar that says Livestock and Pasture. Find the Sheep and Goat section or the Animal Health and Nutrition section and see what we have. Check out the videos in our video library. Dave Scott, my coworker in Montana, has filmed some really concise, really good videos about FAMACHA, about grazing management, grazing to avoid parasites. Um, several of several of his um, present um, publications are coming out to you in this email tomorrow, and along with some others. Don't miss the consortium website, wormx.info. And if you explore around there, you can find so much help with this problem. And if you're a goat producer, the Langston University website is one that I really want to point you to. They have an online handbook for dairy goat producers and for meat goat producers, a course that you can take. It's really good, and it's got chapters about internal parasite management. It's got chapters about grazing management. It also has little tutorials about um, fecal egg counts and some and body condition scoring. So lots of good stuff on Langston's website. And if you're a sheep producer, the American sheep industry has, has um, produced some educational webinars that are archived, so you should check those out. I also, I didn't put this on the list. I don't know how I missed it, but SARE, Sustainable Agriculture Research and education, S-A-R-E dot O-R-G, is a great website, and they funded a lot of the internal parasite research that we have reported on. Um, It's a searchable database. When you, I know some of you are very interested in natural dewormers, there are farmers who have experimented with that, and it might be good for you to go find out what they found out rather than have to... uh, reinvent the wheel, so to speak. So I encourage you to check out SARE. I'll put this on a, the next webinar. I will try to have a resource list that can be emailed out to you um, with these on it. And before next week, I think it might be good for you to do a little homework. I encourage you to go out on your farm and just look around and say to yourself, what are some sources of contamination, some places where you know there's too much manure? too much um, chance that they'll be taking in some infective larva. Do you notice any animals on your farm that have symptoms? We've talked about what those are. Specifically look for those that are lagging behind the others, are laying off by themselves. Look at hair coats, although this time of year nobody's at their best, I don't think. Um, Look for scours. Look for anybody that just isn't thriving. And ask yourself about How susceptible are your animals right now? Remember, the animal status is important. Are they about to lamb our kids? Are they milking? Are they crowded up on a pasture? All coming into a central area? Put some thoughts into that, and then is your nutrition adequate? And the way to assess that is feel the backbones. Especially with my sheep, that wool can hide a lot. So unless I can get in and feel of the animals, I don't really know. So I encourage you to check your animals, too. Thank you very much for your attention and for being here, and I I hope that you feel like you have learned some valuable information and 
that is it for this presentation, Larissa. I'm ready for, for questions. Excellent. Thank you, Linda. That was wonderful. A lot of great information. And like, like Linda um, mentioned, we will be sending out a whole bunch of um, information that, that appeared on the slides and as well as the slides um, in the next within the next day or so. So um, you don't have to, you know, scribble down everything right now. Uh, we do have mm -hmm. um, a good bit of time for some questions. So that that left hand uh, chat bar, um, feel free to to submit. And like I said, we will um, read them and um, respond to them as possible. Um, Linda, there were a couple that came in during the presentation that I can, um, mm -hmm. maybe you can field one about. Um, Cooksidia, and um, because it's in the soil, if it is found in a, a fecal sample, does that mean that the lamb should be treated, or should they only be treated if they're exhibiting active symptoms like the scours? And because that treatment can be so harsh, what is your take yeah, on that? Yeah, the treatment can be harsh. Well, there's some preventive things that we can do, and I'll talk about that more in in part three. Um, a lot of people do feel that prevention, like feeding a preventive medication to the mothers will help lower contamination and, and be protective of the young ones. All of the animals will probably have some cox coccidia in the fecal sample. It's, it's, as I said earlier, it's a numbers game. They can tolerate some and they should. But if it gets overloaded, that's when you're going to see illness. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there are treatments that we can do, and they are harsh, and that coccidiosis publication that I referred to earlier has um, details in it that I really don't want to go into right now. But um, basically, let's try to keep things clean to prevent infestation, and you can do a preventive medication uh, like Bovitec or Rumensin for the mamas to help lower contamination right. on the farm. So it sounds like we'll, and be, yeah, we'll be getting into that. We'll be, <laughs> that sort we'll of be thing. getting yeah. into that. And I just want to say to everybody, this one, this one is a kind of a hard thing because we've talked about the trouble. But <laughs> next week, we're going to start talking about really what we can do to fight back. And I, that's way more fun to talk about and to listen to <laughs> than this topic has been. But yes, go ahead. Well, that's what I was going to say. There are some questions that came in that might be, you know, better suited for next week. Um, but I'll, you know, I'll I'll read them and then we can either take them now or we can um, we can hold them. But or defer. Um, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, the question is: Would pastured poultry run be, uh, behind the sheep or goats help control the larva? Well, they can help. They can help by scratching up the pellet. Remember that pellet is a good a good thing. Although my chicken, I don't know how many chickens you would need to do significant amount of help. Um, anything that exposes that larva to sunlight and drying can help. So if chickens are are pecking and scratching, that can help. Our soil organisms can help. Earthworms, dung mm -hmm. beetles. So mm -hmm. keeping a good, healthy soil can help. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know how many pastured poultry it would take. I'm just trying to think that through. If you think about the quantity of eggs we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I think a better, more helpful than chickens would be cattle. Yeah. And we'll talk about that next time. <laughs> Little teaser. Um, question. Um, is there a cross, a parasite cross between the small ruminants and white-tailed deer that you know of? The meningeal worm infects both the deer and the small ruminants. Other than that, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I can find out. Keeping deer, I always laugh when people say this, keeping deer out of your pastures is a good idea. I have no idea how you do that. <laughs> 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 it's like keeping goats in. Um. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Worse. <laughs> hmm. Let's see. So another question that came in. Thank you for, for that. Um, so question is, you mentioned the contamination zone. Would there be any practice that practices that involve natural spring, natural elements, powders routinely to control the parasite population? Um, if you're listening, the person who asked this, are you talking about like herbal dewormers? What are you talking about? 
see if we have a scroll all the way down. Well, we can hold that perhaps um, we hear back from who asked that, Pamela. Pamela, if you'd like to clarify, you can type into the, the chat bar for us. Um, but let me ask you a quick question, uh, Linda, this might be an easy one. Uh, where can you get a FAMACHA card? Oh, it's, it's not as easy as you might oh. think. To get a FAMACHA card, you have to be trained. And the place to find out where you can be trained is at the consortium website, wormx.info, wormx.info. If you want to be trained, a first step, first step would be look at that website and see if there's one near you. Second step would be talk to your local extension agent and let them know you would like to be trained because there are a lot of people who can do the training um, if they're asked to do so. And if, say, a county or a sheep producing um, group would promote it, bring in enough people to make it really worth the time to, to put on a class. There are a lot of people who can put on the class, and you can find out who can do that by going to the consortium okay. website. Another thing you can do is go to the consortium website and watch the videos. Uh, Ann Sajak has produced a beautiful video about exactly how you do it. It's a good training video. And then I think you can call the University of Georgia and tell them that you have watched the video. They may ask you some questions to check that you really do understand the limitations of the system, which is it's only good for barber pole worm. It does not help if, if the parasite you're dealing with is not barber pole, then it's not a safe thing to use. Okay. So when they're confident that you have done a training, then you can purchase a card. So it's a bit of a process because <laughs> they don't want they don't want people using it improperly because if you don't understand that's only for barber pole worm, as I said, you can get into a train wreck waiting for signs of anemia when you've got sick animals all around. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't know so, that. I didn't know that was yeah. Yeah. So wormx.info, look for where you can be trained and look also for um the videos so you can learn more about how FAMACHA is done and, and when it's done, when it's useful, when it really isn't. Right now, this time of year, homunculus contortus is not likely to be our problem because it's not summer yet. So we can have animals, uh, particularly when those young animals get sick, it's not likely to be homunculus yet. Later in the summer, yes. So just looking at the FAMACHA technique would not be sufficient. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank I do you encourage you to get yeah. a card, though, and I'm glad you all are interested in it. Ah, I see somebody put on the FAMACHA training link in the chat bar. Can you send that out later, Larissa? Yeah, I absolutely can. I'll post. I'll actually post it to you right now just so folks have it, and then um, I will send that in the. I will send that in the in the follow up email. Well, we have a lot of awesome. great questions. Whew. Um, let's see, where should we go next? Um, I, I have a couple people asking um, that maybe join late. This webinar is being recorded and will be um, available for the, the actual recording of it. The audio and visual will be sent out and the, the slides themselves. So if you did miss some of the beginning of it, you can catch up um, in time for, for part mm -hmm. two. Um, Okay, Larissa, so how about, could yes. I could I handle one of these questions? Yeah, that we had absolutely. So sure. You all, when you registered, submitted some questions, and that is so helpful. Thank you for doing that. I hope you will register for part two and again submit questions. This one says, if in an ideal world you could prevent goats and sheep from ingesting parasite larvae, how long will any existing parasites they already harbor survive? So I checked with my friends at the consortium about this, and they actually have an answer because they have put animals in a dry lot situation where they could not be reinfected and then done fecal egg counts. And six to eight months, they're still getting eggs shed. Not as many, but six to eight months is the answer for how long they can survive inside the animal. A little daunting, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, 
Another question was, um, we have constant parasite issues in small lots with not a lot of space. How hard would it be to purchase two feeder lambs for grazing with our goats, and what use is it? The answer is adding two feeder lambs to the situation would probably make everything worse because there's going to be less nutrition available for each animal. There's going to be more uh, fecal contamination in the area. They share parasites, so that doesn't help. What what would help probably, uh, remember what I said about the dry lots, you don't get reinfected. Sometime in dry lot with feeding hay and keeping everything super clean would help. But in some situations, another question was, what do you do if you have limited pasture? Yeah, it's a problem. If you have limited pasture, I think you need to have limited animals. And that's hard for some of us to think about. Thanks for, yeah, thanks for clarifying all that, um, Linda. And I appreciate the questions that come in with the registration as well. Um, and some of them might be addressed here. Someone actually was asking for a little bit more clarification about what the backbone should feel like. And if you could maybe go into that uh, again, repeat that description. Yes, I didn't actually say what it should feel like. I just said to feel it, right? <laughs> um, we have on our on our website, um, my friend Dave Scott has done a, a, a little tip sheet about how to know if your lambs are finished and he has a very good description there about what you're feeling and what it should feel like. But that's going to depend on the species of of animal, too. My dairy goats don't feel the same as a sheep would, right, in the stage of production they're in. My ewes that have been lactating for a month are, are getting pretty thin. But what we want is to not feel a sharp, bony feeling, even if it's a dairy goat. We don't want it to be too sharp. We want some cover over that. Do you remember that picture I showed? Can we go back to the picture mm -hmm. I showed of the... Absolutely. Okay. Let me show you something. And again, with sheep, you have to feel them. You can't see it. Um, that animal there, that boar goat, beautiful condition. Very nice cover. Notice that it's, it's wintertime or early spring. She's not lactating. She ought to look good, Right. If she were seen again two months later while she's nursing, say, she might look quite a bit thinner, but she's still healthy. We just don't want them to lose too much weight. Wait, I went the wrong way. Now, remember the picture about the sick goat, how mm -hmm. different it looked? You could visually see that that animal was too thin. This one's thin. This one's not. She's in good flesh. But again, I shouldn't be telling you this just by looking. You should really get out there and feel with your hands. That one. One more, I think. Oh, yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. That sick one. Mm -hmm. We should be knowing that we're in trouble a long time before they look like that. that answer the question? About the backbone? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, since we're already going back a couple slides, there was a slide that had the various types of parasites on it. I think it was even further oh, towards the beginning. The, the, the microscope one? Yeah, oh, there you go. This um, one? Some, Is that the yeah, one? Some, I believe so. Someone was wondering where they could probably find that. I, um, or if they're uh, here intervet. It is. Intervet. Mm -hmm. Intervet. Good question. Yeah. I should have mentioned that when I was there. Excellent. Let's see. So maybe we have time for um, one or two more questions. I'm just scrolling down. Um, let's see. I saw one up here. Um, so is there any research that shows that certain breeds are more parasite resistant? Do you know of anything? And maybe that's something we're going to be talking about. Yes. And we're going to talk about that quite a bit next time. Um, but I will say here, yes, there are breeds that are more resistant, but there's a lot of variation within the breeds. So, 
and, and I am going to talk about that next time, but this is something to consider. Breeds that are parasite resistant became that way because of selection. Maybe maybe not a, a formal selection. I'll use my breed for an example. The Gulf Coast sheep were here. This is a Gulf Coast sheep. They became parasite resistant because they were managed in such a way that it was sink or swim, so to speak. The tougher ones survived and the weaker ones did not. They were turned loose with no um, management, no extra feed in the Gulf Coast region of Louisiana. And only the ones that could handle a parasite load managed to survive that. If you stop selecting for that ability to manage the parasite load, the breed loses that characteristic. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And even though, listen, even though these are parasite resistant, it's possible to manage them in such a way that they will get sick. Mm -hmm. It's not their fault. It's the management's mm -hmm. fault. If they don't get enough nutrition, if they're put under too much stress, you can still have one whose immune system will be overwhelmed. So, it's a good idea to check into resistant breeds, but then again, it's not the only thing you need to think about. <laughs> so many variables to consider. Of course, goodbye. Have a good day. <laughs> goodbye. Mm -hmm.